purpose. Well, God has a purpose for each and every one of us, and it's really, really important that we find that. And uh, so today in beginning, I just want to pray, and then we'll go into God's Word. Father, thank you for your Word today. Thank you, Lord God, that what you're going to uh, do through your Word is powerful and effective. It accomplishes what you desire it to do. And Lord, I pray that our hearts are ready and prepared to have the Word of God once again fall upon us in a powerful way that changes us and transforms us, Lord, and allows us to become more than we could ever become by ourselves. And so we just thank you and praise you for that. And we just look forward to watching your hand direct this time. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, very familiar verse. It, might, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So there isn't a whole lot we can do about our height. There's not a whole lot we can do about our hair color, unless you, you know, color it. Uh, there isn't a whole lot you can do about your, maybe your weight, unless you go on a diet or you start eating more, either way. Uh, there isn't a whole lot we can do about some of those things. I can't change how big my hands are. There's lots of things about us we can't change, and uh, that's because we're designed by God. We're designed by God to do certain things and uh, there are certain things that we can't change. Now, there are things that we can change. How I talk, how I act, how I respond, how I, how I think. I can change all of that. And that's what really God wants to come and change, is to begin to change all that. Why? Because if you and I don't learn how to talk right, we don't learn how to think right, and we don't learn how to act right, we'll never be able to fulfill God's plan. Would any of you come and listen to me And if I was out drunk last night? Showed up here, <laughs> good morning. No, you probably would say, we're not going back to that church. Why? Because what God wants inside of us needs to correlate with what he says in his word. And so we want to continue to be transformed into God's likeness, into the image of who he is. Now, if you look around today, there isn't a single person here this morning that looks the same as somebody else. Now, this is, such a, this is a small group today. Even if we had the whole city of Devil's Lake in here today, we would find nobody that looks alike. Why? Because that's how different God is. That's how big God is. And then you take the world, and you begin to look at what God does with the world, and there's so many people there that don't even look close to us, and yet all of us are made in God's image. And so when you look at yourself, and uh, if you've ever struggled with who you are and what you're all about, the reality is, is that you're not meant to fit into a mold this world creates. You were never designed to, to be like someone else. Like uh, Michael Jordan, be like Mike. No, no, you're not. Maybe you could use his abilities in some form or fashion on your high school team, college team, or intramural, whatever you do. But the reality is you're not here to be like Mike. You're here to be you. You're here to be designed by God's hand to be you. And with uniqueness comes the ability for God to do what he does. I don't know how many preachers have ever tried to, to mimic someone else when they get up and preach, but that was one of the hardest things that I had to figure out is who am I and how do I learn how to communicate what God's taught me. So I'm not trying to be a Benny Hinn. I'm not trying to be a, 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 a Jimmy Swaggart. I'm not trying to be a Billy Graham. I'm not trying to be them. I'm trying to let God develop me to be who I need to be. And I might have twinges of some of them, but I don't, I don't want to be like them. Why? Because God didn't design me to be like them. They're great examples, but they're not meant to be duplicated in, in how we do things. And so the reality is that God created every single one of us different. And so when, when, when God wants to change us, he, he has a great way of doing it. Turn over to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Verse 1, it says this, Now the whole world had one language and the common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in uh, Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Let 
They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may uh, make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if as one people, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Does it give you an idea of what God can do with unity? You speak the same language, and you have the same purpose in mind, everybody doing their part. That's a picture of unity right there. God was concerned that they could do it because of what they established. Isn't that interesting? So the reality is, is that God has never come to divide his body He's come to unite us under Jesus Christ, hasn't he? He's come to bring us under one leader, and that's Jesus Christ. So if I hear God and you hear God, we should never be in a battle of, of who's, who's doing what or who's, who's more important. Because everybody's important in God's kingdom. There's not a person here this morning that's not important to God. And every one of you have a part to play in what God needs to be done. Now, does God need... Does God always need everything I have to offer? No. You have to learn what God's offered you and learn how to use it because God may not need everything that you have to offer because someone else will step into a, a realm. And so one of the areas that I believe pastors get in trouble is when they try to do everything. And then they burn out and then they're no good to nobody. So the reality is, is that God needs you and I need you. I can't do this by myself. There's no possible way I can play piano and sing. It's just not going to be good. I need my wife. I need people that can play drums. I need people that can sing and play piano and, and do all these things. Why? Because we're a body. We're here not to glorify ourselves. We're here to make sure that you see, when you see us, you see Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing that can happen is when you accomplish something, God, God says, I want you to see me. So he said to them, verse 6, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. Boy, I think that's important to catch this morning. You may not always live here. God may need you somewhere else, and he might put you someplace else than where you're at right now. Just like you guys. You've been here for a while, and God's going to move them to someplace else. And if they were resistant, they could stay here and be miserable. Probably continue to do whatever they put in front of them without too much complaining. But the reality is, is that God has things that he wants to shift and change in our life. And if I, can, if I could describe to you what I feel God's going to do with new life this next year, it's like new life is being pulled out of the mold of 30 years of whatever that looks like. And he's going to lift it out, and he's got a new mold that he wants to set us into, but it's not the same mold. And if we resist that, we'll never step into what God wants. But if we let God put his hands on us and begin to shape and mold and do what God wants to do for new life, why? It's not about us. It's all about him. So he can do what us, whatever he desires. He can shape and mold our lives with whatever he desires. And I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what that looks like. He hasn't told me yet. All I know is every, the last few Sundays, all I've seen is that we're sitting in his hand up in the air just waiting for him to put us in this new mold. And I, I've never been here before. I don't know what, I, it makes me wonder where we're going. Because I know that God's got a plan and he always shows what he wants done. But the reality is that God wants to do something different than what he's done in the past. And if, if I could say one thing, one of the major contributors to churches dying is that they don't change when God changes. Well, we've never done it that way before. So, when you go buy a new car, you've never drove a new car before, so you drive that and you're fine. You'll figure it out. When you get new clothes, you never wore them before, but you put them on anyway. You know what I mean? 
We, we do new things all the time. We just don't think that God does new things. And I want to be honest with you. God is up to doing something new. There's a new season coming, and God wants us to get ready. And the only way we'll be ready is if we allow him to put his hands on us to where he can shape and mold us into the image of what he desires so that we fit into the very thing that God has lined up that's in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's not this kingdom anymore. That's not this world anymore. And I don't care what people think church looks like. It doesn't matter. What matters is what's in heaven today needs to come down. And he's looking for recipient people that are open their arms and say, God, come and do whatever you want. Because when you and I surrender to God and allow him to do what we want, we are the ones that gets transformed. He's, he might change the look of a building, but the reality is, is what's inside of me changes. I learn to see God in a different way. I learn to hear God in a different way. I learn to know what God's saying and hear what God's doing and moving and how he's moving. Even to the point, of, uh, uh, this, I know this is going to sound wacky to some of you, but I literally have been getting dressed on Sunday morning and he says, don't wear that today. It's like, what? All my clothes are fine, Lord, aren't they? I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense in my natural mind. But the reality of God knows what he's doing. So if I'm willing to surrender every aspect of my life to him, to hear what he has to say, and I'll be honest, I've only had that happen two or three times. That's not like a religious thing every Sunday. It's just a, a rare occasion when God does something out of the box. And it causes me to go, wow, Lord, I don't understand, but I guess we'll learn how to surrender to you. Turn over to Proverbs 19. After the Lord scattered them across the earth, there was a reason for that, of course. We see that in the book of Acts as well. He scattered them so that he could continue to make a difference. Proverbs 19. Verse 21. Proverbs 19, verse 21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Has anybody ever drove a tractor that doesn't have power steering? <laughs> For all you that are farmers, you know that when you want to drive a tractor that doesn't have power steering, it takes a lot of muscle to make it move. In fact, when it's not moving, it's the hardest time to make the tractor turn. But once the tractor is moving, it's a lot easier to turn. It's a lot easier to steer. And uh, one of the things that I learned growing up on the farm is that if the tractor's moving, I can turn it a lot easier. And so, same thing with God. God says, a man makes plans in his heart. Nothing wrong with making plans. Nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I'm gonna, I want to head this way. I want to go this way. And as you go... As you're moving, God can now speak and say, Jeff, you need to take a right. You need, not quite that way, take a right. While I'm moving, it's easier to turn me. But if I'm just sitting still and doing nothing and just saying, okay, God, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing, I, I don't see a lot of that happening in Scripture. I see a lot of times when, when, when you want to hear God's voice and know God's voice, just keep moving. Keep going. Keep doing what you do to do. When, when we were in, uh, back in college, Carol and I, uh, I, I, she knew she wanted to always be a pastor's wife ever since she was five years old. She felt that call at the altar in Grafton when she was five years old. Me, I knew God was going to use me because when I was 12 years old, uh, God spoke to me through another man and said, God's going to use you someday. And I was like, okay, whatever. You know, didn't, didn't know what to do with that. I wasn't even saved. I was 12 years old. I didn't get saved until I was 14. So the reality is, is that when we were at college, I knew where I was, I didn't know where I was going. Carol had an idea where she was going, and we were dating at the time, and because she didn't know I was going to be a pastor, she broke up with me. Because she wasn't willing to compromise the call just to have a relationship. I don't know about you, but that's a good woman. For me, I was happy to have a honey. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> I had no idea where I was going. So in the midst of going to class every day, I went and I spent every morning before class, every noon over noon hour, and every evening after classes, I spent at the altar at Trinity Bible College. And I said, God, I'm not leaving until you tell me what you want me to do. So for two and a half weeks, 
I spent every morning, every noon, and every evening waiting for God to speak. Learning a whole lot about reading. I would read, I would pray, I would hear others pray, and really was inspiring. I would hear people worship, and that was inspiring. But I had to keep moving. I had to go to class every day. I had to go about doing whatever we did, and I went to different activities and different things. But every morning and every noon and every evening, I was, I was in motion only to do, say, Lord, what do you want? I need purpose. I need to know what's going on. So for that length of time, the Lord opened that door for me to seek him, to know him, to get to know him more. And in the process of doing that, I can still take you to Trinity, and I can tell you exactly the spot I was in when he said, you're going to be a pastor. So, okay, woohoo. Well, didn't, I didn't any longer have a honey. I didn't, Carol and I weren't dating because she broke up with me. And it was a good breakup because it, it caught, taught me how to make, sure, to make sure that I knew how what God was saying. And so because of that, it wasn't much more than a few days after that, there was a Saturday night live Christian style happening at Trinity Bibles College. There's, people would get up and do different acts and different things, and, and uh, they would, uh, got in there, and I happened to be sitting by a group of friends that I was friends with, and Carol happened to be sitting close with a few friends that she was close with, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, they left her, and mine left me, and we sat there, so hey, <laughs> you know, how's it going, <laughs> you know, next thing you know, we're back on track, because God, God just knew, but the one thing that Carol never told me was, is why she broke up with me, because she didn't want me to go and try to twist God's arm to be a pastor. That had to be something I found out. And so because of that, now we're, we're now uh, 30, almost 32 years in uh, and being married. Aren't you glad for that? Yes. Amen. So God make, we, we make plans, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And even, I'll be honest with you, my dad uh, loved me dearly. Whenever I talk about my dad, I don't want you to ever think I didn't love him and he didn't love me. Loved me dearly. But when I came up here with no salary, we didn't know anything. We, 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 were, we were clueless about life, really, other than the fact that we knew God had called us to come up here. My dad said, you're worth more. You need to find some place where you can get some more money because to, my dad's number one thing in his life was money. And he was good at it. He could look at money and it'd multiply not quite, but he was close. And uh, he was concerned about us having enough finances. And uh, the, so we stayed, come up here, stayed up here. And it took my dad about seven, eight years before he came back up and he said, I guess this is where you're supposed to be. He was supportive, but yet he was cautious. So the reality is that even though man has plans, God's purpose prevails. And here we are 30 years later, Still doing what we believe God is asking us to do, and we are very thankful for you being with us and walking with us and uh, helping us to uh, do what God's designed. Let me ask you this question. Can God change the course of my day to fit His plan? Or is God not in your plan? Can God changed the course of my day to fit his plan. Can you be going down the road and all of a sudden feel the prompting of the Lord and say, I guess I'm not supposed to go there. Now, if you're going to work, you need to go to work. God will not deter you from going to work. I'm just going to say. <laughs> but in the midst of your free time, in the midst of all the other time, God is going to possibly direct what some things that he wants you to do. Um. So it's really, really important to, to hear God's voice in your everyday things, everyday situations, because God does want us to continue to do things. Let's turn over to Philippians uh, chapter uh, 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Let's look at the life of Jesus, one of the greatest examples you'll ever look at. There wasn't one day of his life that was not out of order. There was not one day of his life that he didn't surrender. And he didn't do it because he came from heaven. He did it because the Lord came and anointed him by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was a man in flesh, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be able to do what he did. And he did it perfectly. That's our example. 
We can look at each other and say, well, they did this and they do that and they're Christians. Well, I should be able to do that too. No, not necessarily. What you and I need to learn to do is we're to learn to re realize that just because somebody else can do something and God's okay with that doesn't mean it's okay with me. You're not my greatest example. You are an example to me, but you're not my greatest example and vice versa. I'm an example, but I'm not your greatest example. The greatest example is Jesus Christ. Don't ever take your eyes off him. Allow yourself to, once again, be the focus of your attention. Philippians chapter 2 says, verse 1, If anyone, if you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only of your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, Je Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And after being, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And that is the same process that will happen in your life and mine. I have to learn to become obedient to the death of Jeff Capel so that the life of Jesus can now live in Jeff Capel and what comes out of me is a result of my relationship with him rather than just who I am. I have to allow God to transform inside of me the way I think, the way I talk, the way I act. Why? Because the only way that's truly going to be effective in this life is when Jesus transforms me so that when I act, I talk, and I do things, it's a representation of my Father speaking through me to you because it's a divine appointment to talk with you. It might be a casual acquaintance, but it's a divine appointment to visit with you and talk with you. Why? Because something from God should be flowing through my veins to come to you. And if it's not, there's only one problem that would happen. I haven't been spending time with him. The only reason you would never represent Jesus Christ is because you haven't been spending time with him. You haven't surrendered. You haven't submitted. You haven't let God just come in and just transform you. And transformation will take, the, take, it'll take place every single day until you and I die. There's never a day we're, none, we're not going to be transformed. Never a day. God will continue to transform me. Why? Because just like the picture of new life, what we've gotten here for 30 years is wonderful. It's awesome. It's great. But when God says, I want to pull it out and I want to shape it into something else, it's not talking about the building. He's talking about what's inside. Who's inside? You and me. He wants to transition. He wants to transform. Why? Because he wants it to look like him for what's coming, not what's already happened. You can't change what's already happened, but I can change about what is um, prepared for what is coming. So Jesus Christ wanted us to be of one mind and one heart, being one in spirit and in purpose. Wow. I don't know about you, but I think that's an awesome scripture. Turn over to a wonderful scripture in Romans. Very familiar scripture. We've read it uh, even last week, Romans chapter 8. And I want you to once again just see the, the truths of God's word. I'm reminded of what Paul said. He says, I am not ashamed to write to you the same things I wrote to you before. <laughs> In other words, I don't mind reminding you of what God's already said. And that's for you and for me. I, we never get tired of hearing the same thing. Even if it's John 3.16, it should still minister to your spirit. You might know and say, oh, I know that. Yeah, there's a lot of people that know that. Just ask your kids. How come you did that? I don't know. Did you know that? Yeah, I knew I wasn't supposed to do it. Well, why'd you do it? I don't know. Because you forgot. We forgot what we know. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Do you realize that every human being has already been called? Every person that's ever born has already been called from the most remote 
country or remote uh, place in Africa or wherever you want to call it, Russia, I don't care what country you pick on, every single person has already been called according to his purpose. That was his intent. His intent was you and I to be transformed into the image of who he is. And I don't know about you, but I can see we got a long ways to go. A long ways to go in watching God transform people's lives. Because he loves to transform people's lives. It's according to his purpose. You want to find purpose? Let God define you. Let God shape you. Let God mold you. Let him tell you what's important rather than what the world will tell you. Let God tell you what's important. And you probably will not have a whole host of people coming along saying, pat you on the back. Interestingly enough, as, as John and, and Lori go into this ministry, I can name you by number how many pastors have called me this last 2018 to see how I'm doing. Pastors, the three. There's three pastors that have called me in the last year to see how I'm doing. That's how important it is what he's doing, what you're going to do. Because pastors, they say, are some of the loneliest people in the world. I don't know about, I've never been that lonely, but. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, you need that encouragement. You need that someone to come alongside. So the reality is, is that there's a need for us to once again find our purpose. What is God's purpose? What is God's design? He's called you according to His purpose. Don't ever lose sight of His purpose in the desire of your flesh to want to be important to people. Man, I'd love it if somebody would just come up and say, man, you're doing such a great job. So proud of you, Neil. I'll be honest with you, I got to share a picture when they prayed for you. I saw new, uh, new growth. I don't know what that means or what area of your life, but God says, I see new growth. And you're going to have to mow it pretty soon. That's how much it's going to grow. It's going to, I don't know what that means, but God says he's bringing new growth into you. And uh, it's going to be good. So whatever that means, you take it up with God. I just showed, that's, <laughs> I just saw, he said, yeah, I'd tell him to get a lawnmower because he's going to have to mow it. He's going to make it look good. It's not going to get wild and out of wild and shaggy. It's going to be well kept. So basically what I think that says too is when God gives us something, he expects us to take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the reality is you may not get a lot of support from people, but you know what? The church needs to grow in that area. We need to grow in the area of being supportive and being helpful because God's got plans and he's got purposes. I don't know about you, but you guys all know what these are for. Screwdrivers are screwdrivers, screws things in, hammers a hammer, it pounds things and hits things, destroys things, whatever. Well, in the midst of being purpose, this, these, these have a purpose, they also can be misused, can't they? They can be misused to a point of actually causing more damage than, than, than benefit. So that if, uh, let's just say Art says, hey, you know, today I've got, a, I've got a hangnail. Well, bring your hand over here. Let's take care of it. Wham! No, 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 no. The hammer's powerful. It's wonderful. It has purpose, but that's not the purpose. You see what I'm saying? If Jerry came up to me and said, hey, my knee hurts. Let's get the hammer. Let's hit, hit, hit it. Put your knee up here, Jerry. Let's go. Wham! It's like, well, I don't think that's going to fix it. So the reality is, is that when God creates things, He has a purpose. There's a purpose for it, and there's, there's a misuse of it. And I don't know about you, but you and I are basically tools in God's hand, and He wants to use you, but He doesn't want you to misuse what He's given you. And if you and I learn how to use what God's given us, then guess what? We'll be able to be effective because not every situation needs a hammer. Not every situation needs a screwdriver. But the reality is, both of them have purpose. <laughs> And you and I are no different. We, have, we are full of purpose. But we have to learn where God wants us. What was Paul say in Corinthians? He said, some of you are a hand, some of you are a finger, some of you are an eye, some of you are a leg, some of you are a foot, whatever you want to call it. Some of us are all different things. And we have to learn what's okay, where does God want to use us? Because we all have purpose. 
So we're created to be in God's image. So let's turn real quickly to Jeremiah chapter 18. One of my favorite scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah, if you don't know anything about him, was a weeping prophet. He wept because the nation of Israel rarely listened to God. And so he said, I'm going to send you to a people who don't listen. And I want you to show you some things. And so while, while Jeremiah was down at the potter's house in Jeremiah chapter 18, let's begin reading there. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. You see, he didn't get the message until he was obedient to the command. Sometimes God is waiting for you and I to do what we're supposed to do only to find out there's a message in it. This last week, uh, we looked at Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat. And King Jehoshaphat was leading a group of people that was surrounded by armies that were not their friends. In the midst of what they were facing that day, God told them, get up, get dressed, and go out and stand like you're going to fight. But here's the reality. You won't have to do a thing. I'll take care of it for you. And so when they still had to get up, even though they weren't going to go out in battle, they still had to be obedient, get up and go take their stand where God wanted them to stand in the battle. And in the midst of the battle, God's hand was upon other armies around them, and they destroyed the armies that were coming against King Jehoshaphat and his people. And in the midst of that, the people that came and attacked them, they all turned on each other and killed each other. So here you have a guy that was hearing God's voice, still had to go take their stand, and all the other armies around them destroyed each other, and here he says, I give you victory today. God fought for them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if you were to tell people this, what happened, you'd, you'd think, wow, they're crazy. No, that's what happened. So God can work for us, and he says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from, from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if at that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does not... Uh, excuse me, it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. Now therefore say as the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, look, I am preparing a disaster for you, a, dev a, a devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your uh, actions. But this will reply... But they will reply, it is no use. We will continue to do with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Inquire among the nations, whoever, who has ever heard anything like this? A most horrible thing has ha had done by virgin Israel. Does the snow of Lebanon ever vanish from its rocky slopes? Do it... Do its cool waters from distant sources ever cease to flow? Yet my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless idols, which made them stumble in their ways. And in the ancient past, they made them walk in the bypass and on the roads not built up. Their land will be laid waste and an object of lasting scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will shake their heads. Like the wind from the east, I will scatter them before their enemies, and I will show them my back and not my face in the day of their disaster. Boy, I don't know about you, but your way and my way is not worth traveling. It's not worth traveling. Another great example, but he says, can I not come and do with you, Israel, as the potter does with the clay, where he puts his hand on it, he shapes it and molds it. 
As much as I'd love to go back over the last 30 years and keep every person that's ever stepped foot in this church, I can't do that. Why? Because God's got plans. Plans way different than what I would ever dream. And God's plan may not be for you to stay here the whole duration of your walk with God. But if it is, woohoo! <laughs> on my part. But we're excited if you have to go because God's got plans. And what better plans is there? Everybody stepping into God's plans is only going to reach more people for the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? Anybody getting blinky? <laughs> I think we paid the electric bill this last week. I'm not sure. The reality is, is that when God's got his plans, don't be surprised at what he does. Don't be surprised that he wants to shift and do things different, even though it's something you enjoy. Because God moves things even when you enjoy what you do. Would you stand and pray with me?